Good morning. Good morning. Welcome. It's Sunday, February 28th, 2021. And we're speaking today about living wholeheartedly. So uh, I know that's something that we all <clears throat> want to do, like to do. And uh, it's been for some of us feeling like that's kind of hard to do during this time in this pandemic. But when we talk about what we mean by living wholeheartedly, I think that you will see that it's um, something you can do all the time. Uh, and it may be something you have to learn to do. Uh, we all have to learn to do these things to, to really engage wholeheartedly. But I wanted to share two, two quotes, first of all. One is from Ernest Holmes, and he, he says, life will become one grand song when we realize that since God is for us, none can be against us. We shall cease merely to exist, and we shall live. So this idea that no one is against us helps us, uh, I mean, it can appear like people are against us, but really he's talking about there's no force against us in mm -hmm. this world. There's a force for good only. There's no conspiracy. All right. There is no <clears throat> conspiracy. Uh, but we can certainly feel like there is. Or, and so our talk is about how to negotiate that. And it's based on some of uh, Dr. Brene Brown's work. And she has a quote saying, wholehearted living is about engaging in our lives from a place of worthiness. It means cultivating the courage, compassion, and connection to wake up in the morning and think, no matter what gets done, no matter how much is left undone, I am enough. So there are a few parts about that I'd like to elaborate on a little bit. Um, Before you do that. Yes. <clears throat> I will do an opening prayer. No, no, it's okay. We don't do that. <laughs> Probably a good idea. This is a, this is a church. Uh, I was thinking wholehearted, the whole, wholehearted. When you say wholehearted living, like, yeah, really? How do you do that? But have you ever gone out with somebody for the first time and said, "Let's have a, a half-hearted relationship"? Let's have a half-hearted. No. What's interesting is it's unspoken, but when it's missing, it's significant. Now, can you do a prayer? Okay, <laughs> that's true. And we will define what we mean by wholehearted living. But um, let's do start with an opening affirmative prayer. So let's go within and know <clears throat> that the truth of our being is that we are always held in the arms of God. These arms are energetic arms, knowing that life is for us. All of the adventures, painful and enjoyable are for us, not against us. And everything that appears to be a loss is, is really a gain in the long term. For we know that our life is not simply this physical life, but we are eternal beings, having an eternal experience of growth and multiplicity so that we experience and learn from all angles. So knowing this, we know that life is for us, God is for us, and nothing is against us. We give thanks for this knowing, we release, and together we say, and so, and so it is. It is. <clears throat> I love that. Thank you. Well, done. well so this, this idea that um, being wholehearted, it means living life with faith, Faith in this higher power, faith in that life is for us, not against us, faith in our eternality, faith. In, so there's nothing to fear. I mean, bad things happen in life. I'm not saying they don't, but but to live in fear of them is to not live wholeheartedly. Uh, to live in fear is is to be self-protective and to live wholeheartedly is just to live full out, knowing that that everything that happens, happens for you. Uh, as one of our people, Sandra Marshman often says, I live in a perfectly imperfect universe. In other words, this, this earth school that we have chosen has lots of challenges that we chose many of them. We chose them before coming in that we wanted to experience this challenge and that challenge for that growth opportunity. 
Uh, so it appears imperfect. It appears as if there is evil. It appears as if uh, there are negatives. In fact, it's all for us. So if, if we can get that, if we even this pandemic is for us, we don't like it, we don't enjoy it. Uh, and yet every time I get upset about it, I think, boy, the earth sure is enjoying this break. <laughs> the earth is really enjoying this break from everybody driving so many miles and polluting the air even more. And uh, it will end when it ends. But uh, back, back to this idea that, that worthiness means cultivating. And, and that's a key word. It doesn't mean you're born with it, you have it, you automatically know how to do it. But cultivating, practicing, courage, compassion, and connection. And uh, the courage is the courage to get help when you could talk to someone. That's the connecting. When you are feeling shame or fear or any of those feelings that exacerbate when you are isolating, when you're by yourself. So they have to be practiced, the courage to reach out. Bob and I were talking about our families of origin. That's what we were going to ask about. We had similar families of origin. Perfect in every way. <clears throat> and, and, and you may have too, and I'm curious about that. We'll talk afterwards, those of you who stay online. But uh, what we grew up with is that don't trust anybody outside the family. Don't tell anybody outside the family any of our problems. Don't talk about any of our family members to anybody outside the family. The only ones you can trust are the family. And you can't trust the family. And what we learned is we couldn't trust our family because, you know, siblings fight and don't have your best interests all the time. And sometimes you can't even trust a parent. So you're left with, I can't trust anybody. I'm in this alone. I can't tell anybody <laughs> about my problems because then they'll think less of me. I will, I will be less than. So I have to go around pretending to be perfect and totally self-sufficient. And none of us are. And it makes life very difficult and very lonely. And you often can get stuck in the problem when there really is help for you. Help right around the corner. When you mentioned wholehearted <clears throat> earlier, the, the metaphor and the, the image that came to mind was to, to embrace life wholeheartedly is to say, yes, I'm getting on the roller coaster voluntarily. And yes, I'm going to stay awake for the ride. And so often when we get on the roller coaster that we chose, we say, I didn't do this, it wasn't my idea, I didn't do this. And then we close our eyes and try to hide when in fact wholehearted living is hold on for dear life and stay awake and scream if you have to, but you can do this. <clears throat> you were made for it. Oh, we watched a movie last night that involved uh, teen suicide. And would be and, and the ex teen accidental death and things like that, and teens are, are so so difficult because they don't know how to express themselves and they really are stuck in this. If I if I tell you what's really going on with me, you you'll think less of me. You'll hospitalize me. You'll think I'm I'm defective, and so even when they have counselors and group settings, peer settings and whatnot they often have difficulty saying what's going on with them uh, because they feel this need to be perfect, you know, to not share what they see as faults. And so that leads to isolation and the isolation can lead to suicide. So, because we are not in this thing alone, we really need to connect with one another and it takes courage to connect because we always risk that you might reject me um, in this kid's case, you might be called weird or defective or a freak, a freak, you know, that because kids are cruel, but, um, it's, it's what's needed. It's what's needed. Do you want to talk about how to choose someone to reach out to Bob? Well, one of the things that I learned early on as a therapist <clears throat> from a, a very, very skilled mentor, he said, there's only three things you have to <clears throat> pay attention to to be a good therapist. I said, well, what are those three things? He said, safety, safety, and safety. It has to be safe for the client. It has to be safe. So I thought, well, if I'm the client and I'm also the investigator, I have to be willing to make it safe for myself to explore what it is I need to explore. 
So often what I think is true is that we don't feel safe with ourselves. We don't feel safe with the demons or we don't feel safe with the wild animals that are within. And because of that lack of safety, we act scared on the outside, but we're really just scared on the inside because we haven't decided yet that it's okay. First off, everybody has wild animals on the inside. And many of these animals have been running wild for a very long time. And it's up to us to say, you know, it's okay that they're wild. It's okay that they run the way they run. I'm going to embrace them to the extent that I can. And I'm going to know that everybody's got some. And the safety in knowing that you don't have, you're not the only one with wild animals running around inside can change everything. So as we become comfortable with saying, I know that a lot of what goes on inside of me is wild and crazy and makes no sense at all. And I also know that I'm connected to something greater and more powerful and more wonderful than anybody could even have imagined. And that I am the keeper of all of this rather than I don't know what's going on. So that inner safety, I think, becomes the first step. What we were talking about then is the outer safety. One of the things that happens to people is that they, they, they think it's a good idea to share whatever they feel with whoever they're with. And the truth is, it's not. And what happens is people get hurt because they share with the wrong people information they shouldn't share. And then they think it's not OK to share ever. So what we right. have to do is to become selective. Who can we trust? Who, who is on a, on a mental or a spiritual or emotional plane with us that would that would comprehend and if we get the right person because we've done our homework not only can we be safe we can actually love the experience and so often our truth is not the problem it's who we're sharing it with and who mm -hmm. we're sharing it with will give us negative feedback and i, I shared this a, a while back i, I wrote a, a poem <clears throat> and i shared it at work uh, at the hospital where i was working at the time and uh, the one person that i shared it with she read it, she said, yeah, it's okay, it's good. And I thought, wow, I, I was hoping for some, this is amazing, Bob, this is really great. You see, because I needed to hear from somebody that it was good. I said, okay. And then a Sikh came in, uh, practicing Sikh, and I thought, I'm gonna see what he thinks of it. And I gave it to him and I said, would you read this and tell me what you think? And he said, I can't read this quiet, I have to read this out loud. I said, why? He said, it's sacred. You see, when I wrote it, it was sacred to me, but I had to make friends with it in a way that had it be sacred no matter who said anything about it. And as long as it's a fragile thing and I don't have the courage to declare it and own it, then it isn't something I can share with other people. And so <clears throat> it was a very telling experience, but how often have you shared something really personal, really private, really big with the wrong person? And they said, yeah, well, I've had stuff like that happen to me too. And <clears throat> or get over it. Uh, they try to fix it. Uh, they try to minimize it, they try to ignore it, they make you wrong and put you down because it was because they don't know what to do with it. So safety becomes an interesting and important part, which is also tied together with community. We create, if we can, a community of people of enough like-mindedness that when we say something, they not only get it, but they can become part of the, 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 the journey. And what we want to do is, is not have somebody on the journey with us that opens the door and tries to jump out every now and then. Right. And so uh, they, they, it can often be a best friend. Yeah. It, it can be um, a spiritual center, a spiritual center, a, a couple, mentor, a husband and wife pastor team. Yeah. <laughs> can be that. It can be a therapist. It can be uh, a sponsor. Your dog. Uh, <laughs> this really fits well with, uh, I mean, this is, this is part of, this is the success of 12 step communities uh, because especially when obtaining a sponsor, they make an arrangement to have somebody to call whenever they're in trouble, whenever they're wanting to act on the addiction and call before acting on the addiction, not after. And the sponsor is someone who has a, more experience with sobriety or uh, abstinence and uh, can be that person to listen to compassionately without condemnation and and this creates the community and and so and our spiritual center is such a community you know we reach out to each other we reach out to our um and and have practitioners do prayer, affirmative prayer work for us. And I know you reach out to one another because you tell me that you do. You know, if you follow that model or translate that model, we actually live in a culture where we're addicted to a lot of our, to negative thinking. 
And we need sponsors to help us deal with that addiction. It's not only an addiction of, of, of mind, it's an addiction of body as well, because what happens when we get caught up in negative thoughts and we get caught up in, in fearful thoughts and we get caught up in mistrust of ourselves, we then do all kinds of addictive behaviors, but the real addiction is to the thinking that we're doing. And so in many ways, your community and your loved ones are your spiritual and your and emotional sponsors for you to live an emotionally sober life as opposed to being drunk on negativity or egoism or any number of other things that can that can can undo us. Exactly. And uh, so I was speaking with reaching out, we, we have a Zoom meeting weekly with our practitioners. Now, these are people who have had at least four years of uh, accredited classes from our organization, Centers for Spiritual Living. And, and many of them have had li you know, lifelong lessons in this. And what we do every week is support each other. We listen to what our challenges are this week, what we'd like uh, the rest of them to do prayer treatment for us. And, and we do that, we support one another. And that's helped the connection during this pandemic. So there's no mocking, no sarcasm, no, no putting down, no one-upping, no making wrong. See, these are all things that we, we become accustomed to hearing and, and fearful of. So then we stage what we say very carefully, but we even get to the point where we stage what we say carefully to ourselves so we can no longer be honest with ourselves. Right. And, and, and so the courage it takes, but, you know, because we all think we need to be perfect all the time, uh, it, it takes courage to say, I'm, I'm having trouble with this. I, I need to talk to someone. Because when that person understands that uh, been there, done that, know how you feel, um, it, it suddenly, oh, I'm. I'm just like everybody else. I'm, uh, I'm normally abnormal, <laughs> but I'm okay. I'm okay, and I can love myself because that's important for for living wholeheartedly. Mm -hmm. You have to know you're okay. You belong here. We all have challenges. We have ups and downs, and and they're always changing. And and it's okay to reach out and talk to someone. In in the movie we saw last night, there were two suicidal teens and. And they got together and got each other out, out of the depression and whatnot because someone understood and was there. And so. Without judgment. Right. Listening without judgment and listening to help or support, not to fix, but to help or support. <clears throat> Fixing is different. And very often when, when we share, we, we don't need to be fixed. We needed to be listened to. Exactly. I would also then suggest that this is how it works with spirit that you can listen, you can ask spirit to listen to you and know that spirit is listening. <clears throat> and that in that- It's always list listening. Right, in, in, <laughs> yeah, sometimes I wish. <laughs> Universe but, is always yeah, listening. Like spirit, Careful what you're even thinking. Spirit, Universe please don't listen to this, okay? Yeah. <laughs> I can see it. Yeah, like, and I, can, I need some privacy now. <laughs> every now and then I can hear spirit say, no, 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 no. Thank you, spirit. I appreciate you doing that, yeah. But that, that, that which was in us, which is divine, which that is God, that is ever present, is not absent. I mean, it's ever present. <laughs> yeah. And in the ever presentness of it, then it means you're never alone. It means this is not just your struggle. This is, a, this is you're living a life accompanied with the best company you could possibly get. It's always for you and never against you. Yeah, it doesn't always feel that way, but yeah, that's absolutely true. And no, because it, it doesn't feel that way, it doesn't mean it's not so. Right. So uh, th this idea of community then, how, how many people do you let in to your life to be choices for this community? And what, what is stopping you? Um, and often it, it is this, well, I don't want them to think less of me. Uh, I, you know, I'm pretending to be perfect. You know, that's a, that's a nightmare for that causes disconnection because everybody's got problems everybody's got challenges and when we connect with community not then it doesn't have to be more than one person at a time that uh helps us feel known understood and somehow we can just let go of that shame for not being perfect so just a suggestion if you're dealing with something that's very painful and very scary allow yourself to pace yourself 
in terms of who you share it with or what you share. Allow yourself to pace yourself so that you don't feel internally or externally overexposed. One step mm -hmm. at a time, one little bite. This is how much I'm going to take on today because I, what I hear is uh, once I get things together, you get it together, I'll be okay. You're not gonna get it together. You're going to be able to take a step until you, you learn how to stand and until you learn how to walk. And so, but pacing yourself <clears throat> and asking yourself, do I feel safe? What do I need to do to feel safe? What would be helpful? And I, and I would like to remind you to, uh, that this is a practice. It's not something that you just learn how to do. And now you, every time it takes courage to reach out to someone, every time. Um, every time you have to practice compassion for yourself mm -hmm. and for others. But remember, it's self-compassion first. And if you mess it up, and all of a sudden you find yourself in, in the in the making wrong and stop, smile, start over. You can literally start over. <clears throat> the fact that you're going down any particular road doesn't mean you can't turn around and go back. And I think a lot of times we get trapped by, well, I've been doing this for this long, I can't, I can't now turn it. You can, you can stop. And often I think taking a few breaths. If you meditate, which I highly recommend, meditate, not meditate on what's wrong, but meditate on something like the light, on um, joy, or <clears throat> what I like to do is go to YouTube and turn on a piece of music. Oh, which we're going to share with you. Yeah, we're yeah, going to turn off the recording here because there's copyright rules we want to avoid right. uh, violating. <clears throat> but the uh, the song we're going to be playing is on, is on my Facebook page.